I'd like you to open your Bibles, please, at Jude. I'm going to look at the first four verses tonight. Then, hopefully, next week, verses 5 to 10. Then 11 to 16, and finish the book in four weeks. Well, I know I dealt with 14 chapters in the last sermon, so four verses seem to be easy. But when you look at what's in these four verses, I'm going to miss half of it out tonight. But let's read these verses again. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Do you remember last week I told you that when I lived in uh, Israel, I went down into the Sinai Desert with my brother and we ran out of water. And I went and I filled this water container with dirty water from a filthy cistern that I found in an old Crusader castle down near Dahab. And I didn't drink much of it because I knew how filthy it was. My brother tucked into it because he had no idea. I had disguised it with strawberry cordial that I had, so he couldn't see the color of it, and he drank it, and he became very, very ill. You remember that story? And uh, you remember how fortunate it was that I wasn't ill? (laughs) Well, I virtually had to carry him back home. He was so ill. But the reason I remind you of that story is because I learned a very, very important lesson there. Not to risk drinking dirty water. You might think that's obvious, but about 10 years ago, I went over to India to do some preaching in Andhra Pradesh and uh, around that area, and I had been told, and Trevor and Rona had given me some advice because they lived up in uh, Sheffield, and so I spoke to them before I went, and they said, be very careful not to drink any of their water. And the way they show you a plate is clean is they come and they just sprinkle a little bit of water on it. <laughs> you got to make sure you dry it completely because the water will make you very, very ill, as if I didn't know. They told me when I clean my teeth to make sure I clean my teeth with bottled water because the tap water will make me very, very ill, as if I didn't know. And so I was very, very careful. And they told me to make sure that I only got bottled water that was bottled by a well-known firm because sometimes they'll just, you know, fill tap water up in a bottle and sell it on the um, uh, market as bottled water. So make sure it's good, clean water. Don't drink the water that is there. So I go there, and I'm pretty neurotic just for those three weeks. I wouldn't drink any of their water. I made sure that every cup of coffee they gave me, I checked was the water boiled when they gave me soup? I checked, was the soup boiled? When it came to cleaning my teeth, I made sure I had boiled water. And the guy who was taking me around, and my interpreter, he got fed up with me. And he said to me, he said, you, the Americans aren't like you. The Americans aren't this fussy. The Americans don't bother. I said, are the Americans ill? Oh, yes, he said. <laughs> I said, well, I have learned. You've got to keep away from the poison in the polluted water. If you don't, it will ruin your life. And Jude wants to tell us about the wonderful salvation we have in Jesus Christ. The joy of sins forgiven and peace with God. The privilege of walking through this world where we are citizens of heaven. Where we have a hope that is steadfast and sure. He wants to talk about the wonderful salvation we have. But he's a bit like a good guy who is taking you to India. 
And he wants you to see the wonderful places. He wants you to see the Taj Mahal. He wants you to see these uh, incredible buildings. He wants you to see the wilds of the countryside, the mountains, the beaches. He wants you to enjoy it all. And so he says, look, most important, don't drink the tap water. And you say, oh, why are you spoiling our fun? Don't you want us to have a nice time? He says, yes. But you'll never enjoy the beauties of the Taj Mahal if you don't make sure you keep away from poisonous water. It's obvious, isn't it? If we're going to enjoy such a wonderful salvation, says Jude, it is vital that you keep away from the poisonous teaching that will pollute your soul and not only harm you, not only make you ill, but may destroy you. Watch out. Guard against it. Indeed, we, we, we are surrounded by false teachers who are, are not only attacking us, but they're attacking everybody else as well. And so we have got to contend for the faith. We've got to fight for the truth in these days. If we don't, if we don't take truth at maximum value, if we don't take the fundamentals of the faith as of supreme importance, then we'll drink the muddied waters and we'll be ill and we'll never enjoy the wonderful salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. You can see in verse, is it verse 3, Jude says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, our common salvation, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. I had to write to you about our common problem. We face false teachers who give us poisonous teaching. Have you ever seen a Christian make a shipwreck of their faith? Have you ever seen someone who was once running well in the Christian life? And they go and blow it all. Have you ever seen a person who seemed once, once seemed to be on fire for Jesus Christ and now they've not even turned their back upon the things of God but they're out and out atheists? I've seen people like that. Some people have been very, very close to me. One person who was very, very influential in my life just after I became a Christian now is so hostile to Christianity and hostile to me for following it. And when you see someone who once seemed to be so on fire for Jesus Christ come crashing down and, and making such a mess of their life and turning their back upon Christianity, it makes you think. And you wonder, is Christianity really true? Or have I always been mistaken? Was it just a myth that... I'm believing, and I'm silly to believe it. I shouldn't be believing it. Look, this person believed it, and now he's rejected it. Maybe I should reject it as well. How can Christianity be true when this person who seemed to be doing so well is now doing so badly? And it makes you think, is Christianity true? And then we read the book of Jude, and Jude says to us, yes, Christianity is true. And throughout the whole of the Bible, there are these warnings that there are false teachers, that there are pressures. And if you don't keep yourself in the love of God, if you don't guard yourself, if you don't build yourselves up in the most holy faith, then you will come crashing down. You will make shipwreck of your faith. You will turn your back upon God. You will make a mess of your life. Christianity is true. When you see someone come crashing down, don't say, oh, well, Christianity can't be true, or they wouldn't have come crashing down. You can say Christianity is true. And I will come crashing down too if I don't take heed to myself and my doctrine. Do you see the importance of this little letter of Jude? It's a tremendous warning to us in these days. It tells us to be warned. And as usual, I've got three points for you this evening. The first point is, why should we pay attention to Jude? And the second point is, why should we pay attention to Jude? And the third point is, why should we pay attention to Jude? So let's start at point number one. Why should we pay attention 
to Jude. Because he's not one of the twelve apostles, is he? He wasn't one of the chosen twelve to be with Jesus. So why should we listen to him? And it's such a short book anyhow. Why should we bother listening to Jude? Well, he tells us, first of all, his name. He is Jude. Actually, he was probably never, ever called Jude. In the New Testament, he would have been called Judas. In the Old Testament, he would have been called Judah. But because of the connotations with Judas Iscariot, they thought it best not to call him Judas, but to call him Jude. And um, actually, in Mark chapter 6 and verse 3, he is named as Judas. He is one of the brothers of Jesus Christ. That's quite something, isn't it? Jude grew up with Jesus Christ. He knew exactly how the Son of God lived at home. He had seen how Jesus Christ did his schoolwork, how he played, how he worked, how he submitted to his parents, how he got on with those he liked, how he got on with those who didn't like him. He saw perfectly how the Son of God lived. He knew better than almost anybody what Jesus Christ was like. He is Jude, the brother of Jesus Christ. But he goes on. He, he, um, in church history, we're told that at about AD 90, his two grandsons, called James and Zoka, were arrested. And they were brought before the emperor Domitian and accused of being people who were pretenders to the throne uh, of Israel. And uh, Domitian interviewed them and found them to be common laborers and thought this was ridiculous and sent them back home. But that was Jude's grandsons who were leaders in the church there in Israel. And Jude not only grew up seeing how Jesus Christ lived, but all through Jesus Christ's life, Jude didn't believe in him. Thought that, well, at one point he thought that Jesus was completely out of his mind. I thought that Jesus should be taken in charge and, you know, the men with white coats should come and lead him away. He was embarrassed by Jesus Christ. He was ashamed of Jesus Christ. He didn't believe in Jesus Christ. Indeed, he would mock Jesus Christ. But then after the resurrection, Jude realized how wrong he was and became a follower, a disciple, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he is Jude, the brother of Jesus. But he goes on to tell us that he's not only Jude, but he says he's a servant of Jesus the Messiah. That's what Christ means. So he is the brother of Jesus who grew up with Jesus, saying now he is the servant of Jesus Christ. Now remember, he's a Jew. And the Jews would say they were servants of no one. They were slaves of nobody except God. They would only say we are the servants of God. And yet here is this man and he is saying that he is a servant of Jesus the Messiah. He is saying that that little boy who he grew up with, he played the first century version of football with outside their house, that boy is none other than the Christ, the Messiah, and he is none other than the Co-equal with God the Father. He is God. See what Jude has come to know. He's come to discover. And so he doesn't brag and say, Oh, I'm a brother of Jesus Christ. You should listen to me. No. He says, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I worship Jesus Christ. Don't listen to me because I'm his brother. I'm a servant of Jesus. Jesus Christ. I'm a worshipper of Jesus Christ. And then he says he's the brother of James. It's interesting. He could have said he was the brother of Jesus, but he doesn't. He's the servant of Jesus. His relationship to Jesus was close, a, f a flesh and blood relationship, but it was closer, a spiritual relationship. He's the servant of Jesus Christ. He's the brother of of James, And James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And we have the letter of James that we looked at a few weeks back. Now, when the first persecution of the Christian church came in about AD 33, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, but others scattered. And we're told that Jude went into the area outside of Jerusalem, to the towns and villages there in uh, Judea. And he uh, 
evangelized, he built churches there, and he was a leader of the churches. And he was in complete fellowship with the church in Jerusalem. So he's Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, and a brother of James. And so that's why the early church recognized his letter as authoritative, as of equal weight with all the writings of the apostles. So that's why we should pay attention to Jude. But my next point, second point, is why should we pay attention to Jude? Why should we study this book? You see, it may be authoritative, but that doesn't mean it's relevant for us. I mean, Jamie Oliver's cookbook is relevant and authoritative, but I've never looked inside it because it isn't for me. I'm just not into that kind of thing. And you say, well, why should I bother reading Jude? Okay, it might be good, it might be interesting, but is it for me? Is it for us? The answer is yes, it is for us. Very definitely it is for us. So much so that the Apostle Peter read it and thought this is so important. So when he was old and dying, he sent a letter out into all his churches and in the middle of 2 Peter, he just puts the book of Jude in. Almost word for word, they're in the middle of his letter. It's a bit like this. You go with your family on a cruise down the Nile. You've wanted to do this for a long time. You're all excited, and you're there, and you're on the boat, and there are lots of other people on the boat as well, and you're all excited about having a nice time. When the captain sends over the... Uh, uh, intercom system in the uh, boat you're on. He says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, excuse me, we have received a message from Interpol. There are some drug dealers on this boat who will try and sell you drugs. They will tell you they're wonderful, but it will destroy your life. It will ruin your cruise. Have nothing to do with them. And you think that's pretty important. So what do you do? You get your family, you take them into the cabin, and you sit them down on the bed, and you repeat the message that the captain gave to them, hammering at home, don't you? There are drug dealers on this boat. What they're selling you will destroy you, have nothing to do with it. And that's just what Peter does. He listens to Jude's message, and he says, yes, this is the authoritative word of God. There are these false teachers around who are teaching things that will destroy you. And so he writes to his churches, and he repeats it all. He hammers it home and says, this is relevant to you. This is what you've got to hear. We must listen to it. And Jude tells us here in verse 1 that, that his message is for all Christians. He says he's written to those who, who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. So if you are a new Christian, it's relevant for you. If you're a mature Christian, it's relevant for you. If you're a backslidden Christian, it's relevant for you. If you're a church leader, it's relevant for you. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're a Christian, you've been called, loved by God and kept by Jesus Christ, this message is for you. And therefore, we should study this book. Look at how Jude describes Christians. First of all, he says they are called. See, a Christian isn't a church goer, although Christians do go to church. A Christian isn't a moral person, although Christians do live moral lives. A Christian isn't a person who reads their Bible and prays, although a Christian does read their Bible and pray. A Christian is a person who has been called by God and has heard the call of God and has responded. Maybe you heard the call of God in a very gentle, quiet way. Maybe you heard it sitting on your grandmother's lap as a, a little child and, and she just told you the things about God. And you began to hear it and then at Sunday school and then at church and in the youth work and you've heard it and bit by bit by bit you've come to realize that yes, God is calling you to turn from your sin and come follow Jesus Christ. And you know that you have responded. You can't say when it was. You can't say quite how it happened. But you know, yes, you've heard the call of God and you've responded. And you are now following Jesus Christ. Or maybe it happened to you like a sudden 
hurricane breaking into your life. Maybe you are an atheist, out and out against the things of God. Maybe you are dead against the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then suddenly, in some wonderful way, God broke into your life and you realize it's true. Not only is it true, it's vital, it's important. And so you turn from your sin. You responded to the call of God and you're following Jesus Christ today. But you've heard the call of God. A Christian is a person who has been called. The gospel of God has reached down into our lives and called us. Secondly, we're not only called, but we are loved. Loved by God the Father. The moment you take Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, that moment Jesus Christ takes you as his brother and you are adopted as a child of God. Your sins are forgiven. And everything in your life that spoilt your relationship with God has been taken away. You have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ so that now as God looks at you he sees you as righteous as Jesus Christ you are brought near to God so that you are in a relationship with God and you can call him father and he calls you his child and he loves you when I go overseas on to preach or whatever, I take photographs with me. Do you know who I take photographs of? I take photographs of my family. And when I'm there, I show people photographs of my wife and my children. And I tell them, these are the people I love. Everybody else in the world might be nice, but these are the people I love. This is my family. These are the people I love. And God in heaven says to his angels, these are the folks that I love. He says to the whole world, the church is my bride. These are the people I love. And he says to you, I love you. It's not simply that, oh, I've had pity on you. as You would have pity if you found an a injured dog uh, in your back garden or something. He says, no, it's not that pity. I love you. God loves you. You have been called by God and have responded. And at this moment, you are loved by God with an everlasting, indescribable, measureless love. Loved by God. And thirdly, kept. You notice how it's past, present, and future. We have been called in the past. We are loved in the present. And we will be kept by Jesus Christ for all eternity. That's what it means to be a Christian. A Christian tonight is a person who has heard the call of God and responded, is loved by God and is kept by Jesus Christ. So you are saved and you are safe. Jesus Christ has gone to heaven and he is preparing a place for you and he's holding on to you and one day he will come and get you and take you to be with him there and you are safe. Because of God, called by God, loved by God, kept by Jesus Christ. And so you say, well, that's incredible, isn't it? You don't have to do anything to become a Christian. God does it all. You just, you just get called, get loved, and get kept. It's wonderful, isn't it? Well, in a sense, that's true. But that's not really the whole story because, you see, you hear the call of God and you respond. Just as Lazarus was in his grave and Jesus said Lazarus came out and the dead man came to life and walked out. So you heard the call of God and you have responded. You have turned from your sin. You have trusted in Jesus Christ. You have committed yourself to being a follower of Jesus Christ. You are living for Jesus Christ. It's because his grace has worked in you that you have responded. So yes, salvation is all of God. God has planned it, God has purchased it, God applies it to our life and it breaks into our lives and we respond in repentance and faith. So if you're sitting there waiting for something more to happen to you, thinking, well, I want to be a Christian, but nothing ever seems to happen to me. Let me tell you, it's all happened. When Jesus Christ died upon the cross at Calvary, it all happened. 
The price was paid. Now it's up to you to respond to what has happened. That's what to believe means. You say, yes, it's true, and you respond. So if you haven't responded, it doesn't matter how moral, how religious you are, then you're not saved, you're not converted. And so here and now you must seek God for yourself. You must call upon the Lord so that you might be saved. Why should we study this book? Because it's written for us who are called, loved by God, and kept by Jesus Christ. And my third point, as I come to an end, is why must we study this book? Why should we pay attention to Jude? In two and a half weeks, I think Dennis and Sheila are off to Malawi, and they will take their... Um, malaria tablets. They will, because they know that a tiny little mosquito can come when they're fast asleep and give them a tiny little nip and they can be very, very ill. And so they will fight against malaria by taking their malaria tablets. It's only sensible. And Jude says to us, we must recognize the dangers of false teaching. And therefore, he says, I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints for certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Christ Jesus, our only sovereign and Lord. Saying the mosquitoes are around and they're going to sting you and they're going to make you very ill with a deadly illness. This is why we must pay attention to the book, because of the danger that is all around us. It is interesting that in the first two verses, a Jude has been talking about the sovereignty of God in our salvation, that, that God calls us, that God loves us, that God keeps us. Here in these verses, he puts very much the onus on us, our responsibility. Look, you've got to do some fighting, you've got to contend against this. We've got to get the whole gospel and we've got to work at it all. We trust in God, and yet we fight the good fight of the faith. Because false teachers do come in. I was a young minister. Been on my own for about 18 months in the ministry. Living in Broadstairs at the time. And uh, church was quite happy, quite excited. New people coming in. And a retired couple moved onto the estate and started coming to church just well, four or five weeks before we had a holiday Bible club. And uh, the fellow was a retired doctor, and his wife seemed very nice. And she said, oh, could she come along and help with the holiday Bible club? So they said, yes, of course you can. After one day, we had to stop her. She was not only teaching things that were mistaken, she was teaching things that were drastically wrong. And if the children believed what she was saying, they would not trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. She seemed so nice. She was coming along to the church. She wanted to help. And she got in and first day started teaching deadly heresies. So we had to stop her. It's so dangerous. People come in and they can look so nice and they can speak so smoothly. But what are they saying? What should we look out for? And Jude tells us the two things, the two dangers that we've got to look out for. First of all, concerning behavior. These people say that sin isn't serious. Look at the last three lines. It says, they are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality. They say, God forgives. There's the infinite mercy of God. So don't worry about your sin. And you a girl, school girl. She used to say she didn't mind sleeping with boys. Didn't bother her at all because although she was a Christian, she knew it was wrong. But she could just repent the next day and God would forgive her. So, so what, what did it matter, she said? It matters an awful lot. An awful, awful lot. It probably shows that she's not converted. That's the first thing. It probably shows that she just has no understanding of the gospel or the grace of God or, or the love of God. But secondly, she's playing with fire. Because you see, we cannot repent unless God gives us repentance. So we can't say, oh, I'm going to sin and then I'm going to repent because you don't know whether you'll be able to repent. 
because repentance and faith are gifts of God. And people who say, oh, it doesn't matter, God's grace, just go sin as much as you like, they are wrong. Indeed, that's what the devil says. It's the devil who says sin doesn't matter. And people will come into our church and they'll pretend that they're talking about the grace of God. Oh, it doesn't matter. You shouldn't judge. You shouldn't criticize. You shouldn't say that's wrong. Just accept it all. And Jude says, these people are godless men who bring in destructive heresies. They change the grace of our God into a license for immorality. Jesus Christ saves us from our sins. He doesn't save us so we can sin. It is the grace of God that teaches us to say no to sin. So beware of their teachings concerning behavior. And secondly, beware of their teachings concerning belief. It says the last three lines again, they are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Do you realize that Jesus Christ is our only sovereign and Lord? For he is God, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is our only sovereign and Lord. He's our only sovereign and Lord. He's our only dictator. He's our only master. He's our only sovereign and Lord. Now, how many people do you know who will come knocking at your door and they'll say, oh yes, we believe in Jesus Christ. He's a God. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that, don't they? The Mormons teach that they're all going to become gods. The truth is that Jesus Christ is the only sovereign and Lord. And so like Jude, who was the brother of Jesus, he says, I am the slave. I am the servant of Jesus. The, he, Jude says, the boy I grew up with, I have seen is not only the Messiah, but he, he is the second person of the Trinity. He is the only sovereign and Lord. He is the controller, the creator, the master, the Lord, the ruler of the heavens and the earth. That's who Jesus Christ is. So I gladly submit to him and am his servant. So that's why we must study the book. Indeed, we're told there we must contend for the faith. And I was worried about that. And I always kind of oh, felt di difficult about that because, you know, it gives the impression of going in and finding a false teacher and get going for a fight and just being nasty. And the Bible says you shouldn't be looking for a fight. We shouldn't be angry. We shouldn't be contentious. We shouldn't be fighters. And yet it seems to say that we should be. And then I suddenly realized what Jude was saying. And it's a bit like the Olympics. And it's the 100 meters, and you're there in the great final. And the gun's just about to go. And it goes, and you realize that you're fighting against all these eight people, four on your right and four on your left. So you go start tripping them up, one on that side, and then you trip them up on that side. That's not how you contend when you're running. No, you run as fast as you possibly can for the tape. That's how you win. Now, there is a time in our Christian life where we have to expose error, but we're not... Focusing on the people who are causing problems. We're focusing on the goal. We're contending not against them. We're contending for the faith. And so we're going to preach the faith. We're going to proclaim the faith. We're going to share the faith at work. We're going to share the faith at home. We're going to share the faith in our neighborhood. We're going to share the faith as a church. We're going to fight to bring this faith to this generation. Because there are false teachers who are destroying the church and the world. And we're going to fight. And we're going to run to that line as fast as we possibly can because we are contending for the faith. We're going to believe it. We're going to know it. We're going to teach it. We're going to defend it. We're going to proclaim it. We're going to contend for the faith. Well, how do we contend for the faith? Well, that's what the rest of Jude tells us. So you just have to keep coming. Same time, same place, next Sunday. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ is the only sovereign and Lord, the baby born at Bethlehem, the man crucified at Calvary, the corpse laid in that grave of uh, Joseph of Arimathea is our Lord and our Savior. Up from the grave he arose. All authority in heaven and earth belongs to him. Jesus Christ is King. Thank you that we know this is true. Pray that we might believe it, that we might fight for this truth in this generation, that we might bring this truth 
to this world which is perishing without it. And we pray that as a church we will not be poisoned by false teachers getting in, but we will drink of the clean and pure waters of your word. And we shall have a firm faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and a holy life as his disciples. Thank you for the privilege of being called. Thank you for the wonderful privilege of being loved. And thank you for the guarantee of our salvation because we're kept. We give you our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.